Kia ora katoa katoa everyone. Um, welcome to the Tuyo Peter Ora NZILA Streetscape Seminar, um, or webinar, sorry, um, Toward an Urban Ecology. Um, before we get going, I'd just like to um, acknowledge our sponsors um, for today's session, um, Streetscape, uh, after sponsoring our really successful um, speaker series um, with Catherine Mosbach in 2019. Um, we're really pleased to have Streetscape back on board for, um, for this year's speaker series. Uh, and to bring this learning opportunity to your home, uh, your office, um, or wherever you may be listening uh, right now. Um, and so just before we kick off, um, we've got a, a brief word from Streetscape. Too. Streetscape is New Zealand's leading manufacturer of quality street furniture, lighting poles, shelters, and sculptures that breathe life into our open space environments. Collaborating with landscape architects and designers to share our manufacturing expertise and experience, we create solutions to meet your design brief, your budget, and your project delivery deadline. At Streetscape, we have a great range of off-the-shelf furniture. Together, we can modify and customize our existing ranges to suit, or we can provide the design support to manufacture fully bespoke furniture for your project. With all furniture proudly manufactured in New Zealand from locally and ethically sourced materials, and with over a hundred years of combined experience, you can be sure of the craftsmanship. Quality products made to withstand our unique environmental conditions while meeting all local health and safety standards. Local doesn't just mean local knowledge and local jobs. It also means reduced lead times and a local team who manage every step of the way with you to see the project from your concept through to final delivery. Aotearoa New Zealand, these are our places, our communities, our environments, and we want you to enjoy them the way you imagine them. That's why we go that extra mile every time. Streetscape, turning your imagination into reality. Streetscape, in conjunction with the NZILA, are proud to sponsor the Streetscape Speaker Series. Well, thanks again to Streetscape for um, their sponsorship. Um, firstly, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we will have some time for um, question and answers at the end of the presentation. So um, if you have questions, um, drop those down into the Q&A menu, which um, I think is in the bottom right hand corner um, of your screen. Um, and we'll run through those at the end. Um, so look, it's my pleasure um, to introduce our speakers for today's uh, webinar. Uh, firstly, um, Kate Orff, um, we've been trying to get her for a while, so we're really pleased to finally um, have the opportunity to do so. Um, Kate's the founding principal of SCAPE. I'm sure um, you've come across SCAPE um, in your travels. Um, um, SCAPE are well known for leading complex, creative and collaborative um, project and, and work processes that advance broad environmental and social uh, prerogatives. Um, Kate focuses on retooling the practice of landscape architecture relative to the uncertainty of climate change and creating spaces to foster social life, which she has explored through numerous publications, activism, research uh, and of course projects. Um, Kate's going to discuss SCAPE's high-level practice with a particular focus on coastal processes and climate change. Uh, and joining Kate um, from the office um, in, in New York, um, Tama Whiting, uh, one of our own um, going great guns overseas. Um, Tama is a designer at SCAPE and a graduate of the Victoria University um, of Wellington um, program. Um, Tama seeks to integrate and adapt ecological systems into the built environment and has a keen interest in exploring cultural narratives with local communities. Uh, so today, Kate's gonna present um, on SCAPE's broad approach to landscape design, demonstrating how to move beyond familiar and increasingly outmoded uh, ways of thinking about environmental, urban and social issues as separate domains and advancing and advocating for the synthesis of practice to create a truly urban ecology. Kate will discuss a range of participatory and science-based strategies 
that advance urban ecological design through the lens of scapes work. Uh, and following Kate Tama, um, we'll talk to uh, one of their recent projects, uh, the Tom Lee Park, uh, as an example of scapes approach um, to design. So um, without further ado, um, welcome Kate and Tama and uh, over to you, Kate. Thank you so much for that introduction. I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, I'm very pleased to be here uh, with Tama, who uh, is uh, an emerging uh, super designer at Scape, and it's, you know, um, it's just inspiring to be able to share our work with you today. And the goal is to do a broad overview, and then Tom will take a deep dive. Um, he has uh, an incredible kind of personal history and background, and uh, it's people like Tama that make Scape the Office uh, what it is. We're a dynamic group. So um, I am sort of trying to reset uh, the practice of landscape architecture relative to the global landscape emergency. I feel like we've all been trained very well to specify this product and to select, you know, to sort of make beautiful parks and playgrounds. We have to keep doing that. But what do we really need to be doing relative to some of the more shocking uh, and, and distressing uh, facts in terms of the actual destruction of the physical landscape and the flora and fauna uh, that inhabit it? Um, and, and for example, you know, a million plant and animal species at risk of extinction, wetlands disappearing three times faster than forests. The Living Planet, Planet Report revealing an incredible decline. I was born in 1971, so during my own lifetime, two-thirds of decline in wildlife populations uh, since that time. And here in the, the Northeast and the United States, we have birds vanishing, migratory birds vanishing, uh, declining by three billion. The numbers, and you know, we're so in, uh, kind of numb to the grass and the statistics, but the fact is that we are landscape architects. We're trained as designers. We're trained as uh, planners and civil engineers and sort of thinkers and conceptualizers of land. But while we are doing this, the actual landscape is, is sort of disappearing. So I've been uh, trying to forge different pathways around uh, forging, you know, like, uh, how do we do this? How do we, how do we think about land and landscape differently? And it is time to think bigger and more expansively about infrastructure and landscape and policy and begin to weave these elements together uh, and create broader front initiatives that can truly design the landscape at the scale that is needed. And we need to do this in light of climate change, the immense uh, pressure uh, and uh, to decarbonize our economies, uh, social justice uh, um, prerogatives and, and biodiversity. So a lot of what SCAPE has tried to do is interweave these topics within our projects and within our research books and practice. So how can we combine ecological regeneration with climate risk reduction, reducing climate harm, and also kind of like centering justice. It's very difficult. And so my, <laughs> my most recent publication, um, uh, I wrote a chapter in this book called All We Can Save. And uh, you know, it is a, a book of women climate leaders who you know, are trying to you know, center truth, courage, and solutions uh, for the climate crisis. And so I kind of, many of my thoughts are, are described here, but. In, in a nutshell, it's like we need to truly uh, evolve our practice and, and get our hands in the mud. Uh, and we have to not just think about design as a kind of a, you know, uh, um, you know, improvement of the, you know, land around a building or the immediate sort of urban uh you know, plaza in front of a building, but we have to kind of get truly at a landscape scale to actively love and mend our messy, swampy, dusty, busted up landscapes. You know, the tide pools for darting crabs, dark forests for stark scarlet tanagers, dead trees for owls and bats, thick grassy dunes for nesting plo plovers. And so tending to and dwelling among our living landscapes can start small, but, uh, you know, we also, you know, face this global landscape emergency. So let's knit what we can back together. So what uh, I think the goal here is, is to, you know, start in your immediate environment, 
um, try to work beyond the, you know, the professional lens of just like the site that is, is, is sort of given to you and uh, get your hands in the mud and, and try to figure out how to challenge the status quo and ask what not, you know, what are we doing as landscape architects, but <laughs> shift to what needs to be done and, and try to figure out how to work in that mode. Um, so I've tried to work in that mode in a number of different ways uh, by conceptualizing the issues and connecting the dots. Landscape training is incredible for connecting the dots. And this has been sort of expressed in publications and exhibi exhibitions that expand the purview of, of landscape architecture. I've tried to forge and found scape and drive it as an idea-driven practice. Um, I've tried to uh, create processes uh, that are purposeful, collaborative, and responsive, and of course, you know, try to express the mission at whatever scale that we're working at in, in constructed landscapes. So conceptualize the issues and connect the dots. I feel like often landscape architects are, you know, missing sometimes the broader geography or, or territory uh, in terms of, you know, our analysis sometimes is just delimited to the site which is on our drawing table, right? But this project, which was called Petrochemical America, uh, began to look at the American landscape writ large. And uh, so uh, this is an image that I took uh, in Cancer Alley, which is in Louisiana on the Gulf of Mexico. And it's just to sort of say, this is the uh, uh, carbon intensive landscape and the sort of sacrificial zones, if you will, that have been determined by this carbon intensive economy. And this book project called Petrochemical, and I hope you have it in a library or something, it's going into his, its third reprint. And so we'll have new copies. It's sold out now, but we'll have new copies on soon, uh, was a collaboration with a photographer, Richard Mizrak. And so Richard sort of traveled uh, this zone between Baton Rouge and New Orleans and began to photograph. And I met him uh, more than 12 years ago uh, and uh, began to look at his photographs and began to sequence them and draw a narrative through them. This one is particularly hard to look at if you look at it for too long, because in the background, you see, of course, a chemical plant, which was, you know, Union Carbide at the time. And in the foreground uh, is cemetery uh, of a Black freedman's town. And so, you, you know, the book really is a, a challenge to unpack the landscape that we're putting our eyes on every day and to try to understand the deeper and systemic connections that have made it not just to beautify it. We cannot do that any longer. So just a few words on this, this publication, because this could take an entire lecture, but you may be familiar with this wiggle of the Mississippi River, the footprint of New Orleans here on the right of the screen in Baton Rouge on the left. This is approximately 100 miles. And so you know, we began to unpack the physical landscape and understand how it began to transform from an early Mississippi with a sort of a meander and, uh, and uh, floodplains and uh, dwelling mounds of indigenous peoples to being slightly straightened uh, and farmed as uh, incredibly brutal uh, plantation with enslaved peoples uh, farming uh, indigo and cotton and then how that those plantations were sold to uh, industrial uh, behemoth uh, companies. And then uh, that has created this alarming juxtaposition that you see in this image here, where you had big factories next to very small African-American towns. So, you know, I can't go into incredible detail, but I would just encourage uh, you and all of us in our daily lives to begin to try to unpack the everyday landscapes uh, that kind of go beyond what is uh, on the frame of the drawing table. So we did this through drawing, uh, through writing, and through kind of like, this is my sketch with Richard of like, here's how I would work to kind of like pull threads from the photographs themselves, sequence them and begin to tell stories. And that story is one of extraction and describes the American landscape as a machine for consuming oil and petrochemicals and ultimately offering uh, alternative models and vision about how to move uh, work in a different way. So I'm just gonna flip through some of the images in the book 
uh, that describe uh, the through line process, how we began to sequence up the photographs, um, pair these with extended captions and essays, and ultimately sort of lend uh, a, a future vision of the landscape that moves from a one-way system of extraction and waste to the kind of looped and living systems that you see here. Um, and that became uh, a traveling exhibition, a book, um, and, and, and a lot of different sort of learning opportunities came out of that. But now over to practice. Uh, so in the skate practice, um, uh, we tried to sort of advance really this kind of um, you know, collaborative, community-driven uh, and, and sort of climate-aware you know, frame of reference. And so this book, Toward an Urban Ecology, and its four chapters of Revive, Cohabit, Engage, and Scale uh, begin to speak to our work. I am a former lacrosse player. I think you play lacrosse in New Zealand and uh, captain and everything. So I really think about the office as teamwork and I'm just the coach. Um, this, our number of people has doubled at this point as Tama knows, but um, in, in a way it's um, the office itself is kind of structured as, a, as just like a super organism, um, not as a kind of a top down um, uh, sort of a typical atelier. And so we try to look at landscape architecture and practice landscape architecture through the stance of activism. And in tor Toward an Urban Ecology, I kind of write and unpack that thesis. This juxtaposition of images was very inspirational for me. Um, my first uh, sort of foray into landscape was studying Jamaica Bay, which is a water body that you could see on the left of the screen. And so, you know, I was very frustrated with, frankly, the scale of landscape architecture and how somehow it didn't hit uh, this transformational uh, gesture that uh, needed to happen in order to really engage the whole scale of this bay. But this gave me a clue. On the left-hand side of the image, you see uh, some um, you know, uh, restoration work, uh, the sediment being sprayed on by the United States Army Corps of Engineers, so a very top-down uh, 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 kind of method. But then on the right hand side of the image, you can see these kind of local volunteers from the American Littoral Society after school programs and so on that are eight that kind of work together to plant, you know, this, uh, this very, very broad, vast system. So the point is, you need not just the landscape scale that you and I and our, our, our profession is very expert at. We need these two other scales to kind of uh, be you know, integrated into our project work. And so that's really what I've tried to do, uh, integrating forms of social life and ecological regeneration strategies to expand the purview and kind of push across uh, to try to work at the scales that we need to work at. This was an early project in 2009 called Oyster Texture that also, uh, I think, um, was, was years uh, in advance of, of, uh, of Hurricane Superstorm Sandy here and uh, you know uh, Hurricane Irene and others. And so I was trying to craft a vision that was really built in that pair of images that you saw earlier, which is big picture transformational thinking in terms of physical need to repair, move and stretch the, the geography uh, 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 and very localized small scale intervention and community engagement to make that happen. So I've been practicing this landscape architecture as kind of a choreography between these scales. Here you can see New York in the background and then the concept of oyster texture was to create a kind of a living reef, a community-based reef that cleans the water, slows the water, um, uh, and kind of protects inland communities that you can see here on the right, and that that reef was uh, monitored and seeded uh, by uh, local oyster growers and communities, um, community oyster gardening projects in the adjacent bay that was connected. And it was kind of inspired by the life cycle of the oyster itself. After Superstorm Sandy here hit in the region, we participated in a project called Living Breakwaters, which was, um, you know, um, funded by um, what our HUD, which is Housing and Urban Development, a federal program. And so many of those concepts from oyster texture became very, very real after Superstorm Sandy. Our region uh, was truly devastated. We have loss of life. So. Um, through this rebuild by design process, um, we studied uh, 
eco ecology and infrastructure at this regional scale and begin to scale down and begin to locate a, a project. Uh, this is the south tip of Staten Island in New York City. Uh, and this area actually had um, loss of life, tragic loss of life, and was really uh, uh, hit hard um, by, by, by the storm. So we developed um, what you saw in oyster texture a couple levels further uh, and developed a strategy for large scale breakwaters that create habitat, increase biodiversity, and bring back that kind of structural marine habitat and improve ecosystem health. So here's a zoom into that breakwater. And we piloted uh, five different kinds of urban oyster restoration techniques. You can see them here. This is the largest urban restoration project, I believe, in the United States at this time. And we're working with the Billion Oyster Project and after school programs to seed the oysters. So, very similar of a big picture, federally funded project uh, combined with like on the ground education, learning, and engagement. So I'll go through these. We, we um, uh, expanded this as a kind of an educational project too. This is a, an exhibit in a New York museum. We design exhibits and we really kind of see outreach uh, to the next generation, frankly, as key to uh, our mission. So now just down just to tr transfer to scaling ideas to the built work. I mean, we have work all over the New York region and now uh, all over the United States. And it ranges from like a very small pocket park. This was done maybe eight years ago um, to, you know, plazas, you know, that we're trying to kind of capture and filter water, rip out the pavement where we can and uh, kind of renature the city. Uh, we try to express like local ecology where we can. This is a project of ours in, in, in Brooklyn that kind of traces the, the, the pull and the, the kind of movement of the glacier uh, across this very, this very piece of ground uh, through pavements and patterns and, and through integrating kind of this rewilding of the city. We try to bring uh, the forest into the city. This is a plaza that we built in, uh, in New York City. We try to delete the grass, delete the lawn wherever we can. This is a project for the headquarters for the United States Golf Association. We try to cut down and step down to kind of, you know, blur that those moments where land meets water. And here is a project in uh, San Francisco that's under construction called China Basin Park that has big expansive lawns, you know, lifted groves, uh, kind of coastal edge plazas, big kayak ramp, and this um, element of tidal shelves that is meant to express not only sea level rise, which is an incredible threat to, to San Francisco, but also, you know, as sort of at a long, longer time scale, but also uh, the kind of daily tidal levels. And you can see across the, the way there, the San Francisco Giants Stadium. So this is a coastal park. And I, I'll only say this like as a shout out to the rest of my team, but these gestures that appear in a, you know, an image like this actually take many years to get through the morass of regulations in the United States that pretty much define our coastal edge as a vertical steel bulkhead wall. So projects like this kind of have to pilot difference. From a design process, this is how we work sketching. These are my kind of thoughts and ideas. We had an interview. We kind of transplayed that interview through layers and iteration into three-dimensional designs, showed our, our client uh, many different options, um, and tried to convince them of the option that we want, <laughs> as everyone does. Um, and then, you know, developed a, a, a sort of a, a, a plan that I think um, really looks to the future for San Francisco. And this is a view looking across the bay uh, with the tidal shelves uh, highlighted. So even though we have to step down, um, and that is from you know, land to water, another massive effort that I think all landscape architects can, can refocus on is these broad transformative connections at, uh, at a truly a regional scale. Here's a project in Atlanta, Georgia, called the Chattahoochee Riverlands, which was almost brought our office to its knees. It is 100 linear miles of blue and greenway, literally that same scale of Cancer Alley that I started uh, the talk with. And um, so this was a landscape-led 
um, planning and uh, project really. And uh, as a result of our design, that was incredibly intensive in terms of a uh, community outreach standpoint. Here in orange, you can see the study area and that's Florida um, and that's Alabama. So you can see you know, the incredible potential of a project at this scale to decarbonize, to get people out of their cars, to repair the river, by, the river, the river shed, the river walk, and, uh, uh, and to kind of move us forward. So we developed a plan over several years uh, and essentially uh, are piloting a, a number of uh, smaller five projects um, at this juncture. And it's really these expansive connective landscapes that I think are, are truly the, a big part of the future of our profession. And I think we had about 100 community meetings, if not more, during this process. So um, I am going to kick it over to Tama in just a minute, but a project that has been um, incredibly important to our office, especially uh, in light of in this past uh, several years, uh, has been Tom Lee Park in Memphis. And um, Tom Lee uh, Park is just one sort of stretch of the broader Memphis riverfront. It's Memphis is the largest city on the Mississippi River, and it has this incredible culture and incredible history. Uh, and so we're incredibly fortunate to be able to work on this. Uh, and we worked on it for a while and then COVID hit. And then we had uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, which was truly um, a, a, a awakening and a kind of a reckoning here in the United States. And so uh, a lot of our design work uh, really kind of pivoted and began to uh, transform and change relative to not only the, you know, the ecology of the Mississippi River, but looking at the broader Memphis context in terms of um, environmental justice and, and to trying to, to sort of address in a creative way uh, the systemic racism that we see uh, in our society writ large. And Memphis is doing an incredible job to do that. So I will stop sharing. I believe I have stopped sharing. And Tama, I'll turn it over to you to do a deep dive into Tom Lee Park and tell that story. Oh, kia ora, everyone. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, such a pleasure to be here uh, speaking alongside Keo for uh, Tuia Pito Ora uh, in ZIRA. Uh, my name is Tama Whiting. I'm a designer, and for the past three years, I've been based in New York City. Uh, my roots are in Aotearoa and I whakapapa to uh, Te Whanau uh, Apanui on the east coast of the North Island. Uh, I'm born and bred Wellingtonian, and I studied at Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, I worked for a few years at Studio Pacific Architecture in Wellington. Uh, I can see some of you guys are on this call um, before joining SCAPE in 2019. So uh, my experience so far has been a bit of an unexpected roller coaster, but a great experience nonetheless. I spent about three weeks in the Scapes office before the pandemic kicked off uh, and have since then uh, worked most of my time remotely uh, from my Brooklyn apartment. Uh, you can probably imagine that we suddenly had a lot to figure out uh, with me being new uh, in terms of logistics, uh, maintaining collaboration given our profession uh, and other nuances that we ended up just having to uh, figure out on the fly. Uh, so. On that note, today I'm presenting a project I've been involved with uh, from concept through to <clears throat> construction uh, called Tom Lee Park. Uh, this project was designed mostly in a remote capacity uh, between our team based in uh, New York and uh, New Orleans, uh, and it's currently under construction. So uh, to give you a bit of context of Tom Lee Park, it's a 30 acre park located in Memphis, uh, Tennessee. It's on the edge of the Mississippi River and it faces towards uh, Arkansas on the other side. Uh, the site is reclaimed uh, land that was built by the uh, United States of America, oh sorry, United States Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, you can kind of see this uh, dike wall. Uh, it's basically holding this, all of this land in place and stopping from uh, washing down the Mississippi. Uh, the rest is mostly lawn. 
uh, with a path network and a few random trees around the car park. Uh, this land is home to uh, seven First Nations tribes, uh, two of which still have a strong presence in Memphis, uh, the Chickasaw and the Cherokee nations. On the left, uh, some images showing it as part of the major shipping route uh, during the industrial age. Uh, and it also played a part in the dark history of the land with the slave trade. Uh, the photo on the right shows the site before it was built up. So who, who is Tomley? Uh, Tomley is a hero, uh, a selfless uh, African-American man who worked on the river. On May 8th, 1925, he was uh, going about his daily tasks uh, when a boat capsized uh, with 72 people on board. Uh, Tom Lee, who surprisingly couldn't swim, uh, acted without hesitation uh, and used his small boat, which is pictured on the right uh, in statue form, uh, to help as many people as he could. Uh, and he ended up saving 32 people uh, from drowning and was honored at the White House uh, and the park was named after him, um, which was uh, pretty crazy at the time, given uh, segregation in the US was uh, very prominent then. Uh, so again, another existing shot, uh, you can see uh, limited programming, expansive lawns, uh, which are actually used by the city of Memphis uh, for one of their biggest annual events uh, called Memphis in May, which is a music festival. Uh, it's probably similar to like rhythm and lines, I guess, uh, or something of that scale anyway. Uh, the large festival spaces uh, were a design requirement for us. Uh, so we did have to kind of work around these and maintain their footprints. Uh, here's a shot of Tomley Park uh, when it flooded in 2011. Uh, and you can see the Tomley statue partially uh, submerged. Uh, another design parameter was obviously like flood levels uh, and uh, trying to uh, maintain the strength of the current dike wall. So uh, cut and fill was limited uh, in our design and we were uh, told we could only uh, put fill in very specific areas. So uh, Memphis today, uh, Tomley Park has great connections that lead uh, to significant locations uh, within the city, uh, such as the FedEx Forum, uh, the National Civil Rights Museum, and uh, many others. Uh, we tried to draw a lot of our inspiration from existing formations that naturally occur along the Mississippi River. So things like uh, riffles, uh, oxbows, and things of that nature. So this is uh, Scape's design for Tomley Park. Uh, you can see we developed a strong language of these uh, river formations uh, that splay outwards towards the river uh, from each of the park entries. And then we tried to, um, you know, stitch these together across our four character zones. Uh, the first zone being uh, the civic gateway, which is the main entry. Um, and then the active core uh, with play and active programming. Uh, the community batcher with more uh, contemplative uh, memorial and gathering spaces. And the last one, the habitat terraces, uh, which was uh, more for like immersive experiences that allow engagement with local flora and fauna. And it's actually where uh, part of this dike, oh, <laughs> part of this dike core actually failed down this back end here. Uh, so it wasn't maintained and you actually see a lot of this uh, natural vegetation kind of creeping back through. Uh, and there's a lot of mature trees there. So again, uh, some of our goals were to improve access to the park, uh, reinforcing these urban connections back to the city uh, and bringing people down from the bluff uh, to the river. Oh, sorry, uh, creating a legible hierarchy of access routes that uh, tie into neighboring city parks uh, and path networks, and then uh, stitching everything together to create a cohesive design that transitions between uh, active and passive park programming, um, revealing and creating knowledge about the Mississippi River and its uh, overlapping histories. 
so an area of our vision for Tomley Park, uh, you know, providing flexible and active spaces during all seasons. Um, so there's a variety of, um, you know, sheltered spaces too, um, spaces that could be turned into uh, ice rings and other things. So diving into more detail, uh, starting with the Civic Gateway. Uh, here we're emphasizing um, this is the main entry to site, uh, trying to frame these views uh, and bring people down off the top of the bluff uh, to engage with the river edge. Uh, and we used an accessible switchback that leads into a kind of formal civic space uh, with a water play feature. <clears throat> Uh, this is a, this plan view shows how we had to work with uh, the existing structure on site, which was, it's called uh, Beale Street Landing. Um, and we tried to embed this into the landscape fabric, um, which actually works well because it complements the civic nature of the space uh, being a hub for uh, drop-offs and it also facilitates uh, ferry and boat rides on the river, which is like uh, this part. So uh, some construction photos of the switchback. So this is all accessible um, all the way down to the bottom. And you can see this uh, kind of dramatic grade change between the top of the bluff and the park. Uh, some locally sourced stone uh, being laid. Uh, the switchback was designed to imitate naturally occurring striations that you see along the Mississippi. And uh, as more of these get placed, you'll be able to see as you move up the bluff that these stones uh, actually change tone and color. Um, this is a view of the civic area uh, with a misting water feature um, that can be turned off for a variety of other activities. Uh, we couldn't do cut and fill in this zone given the proximity to the dike wall um, and complications that extra loading might cause. Uh, so the next zone is the active core. Here, our focus was to centralize all of the active programming. Uh, we wanted to create a play destination that was inclusive of a variety of age groups and demographics. Um, the pavilion was designed by Studio Gang Architects. And uh, sorry, the Civic Canopy and the pavilions were designed by Studio Gang. Um, the, pavilions being these uh, kind of pods here, and they're intended to provide food and uh, beverage services, um, but you can also rent uh, the back of them out for like birthday parties or other events. Um, we were also able to play up the topography closer to the road on this back side of the playground, um, and that helped to enclose the playground and keep kids away from traffic, uh, and while also focusing the views uh, back to the river's edge. So construction happening today. Um, they're beginning to work on some of uh, those landforms closer to the road, um, but we probably won't any we won't we probably won't see any dramatic change for a few months though. Uh, the river lounge, which is intended to be a gathering space or a spillover area for families to sit up for lunch and things like that. Uh, the civic canopy, uh, which, you know, is probably the largest, well, it is the largest shade structure uh, on site. Um, and it is intended for uh, play courts. Uh, you might hold smaller um, events here maybe like music, like smaller, uh, more intimate music festivals or, um, you know, social sports and games. Um, and then you've also got these kind of seating pods uh, where there's also hammocks and uh, some swing sets, but for adults. Uh, the playground and fitness areas uh, cater to all ages uh, and the play elements were, um, supposed to represent the local flora and fauna from the area. Um, this, again, this meandering uh, 
kind of feature that goes through the playground was just again stitching this all these spaces together. Um, we worked with Monstrum from Denmark to create these uh, giant otters, uh, which are pretty cool, um, and a sturgeon. Um, there's also a black salamander uh, not showing in these views. So the next zone is the community batcher. We created a more intimate experience or atmosphere in this zone. Um, we were you weave through these riffles uh, in a procession towards the framed uh, memorial statue of Tom Lee. Um, that then leads you into other spaces that are more isolated and separate, but also allow for, uh, you know, gathering. In the plan, you can see the memorial is framed by the entry point uh, through here, so a direct sight line. Um, and then also we had the opportunity for topographical change at the back here too, um, with different uh, gathering spaces kind of dotted along here. Again, construction is slowly happening uh, with the land getting shifted into place. Um, but again, just trying to create a bit of height in the zone uh, so the bluff doesn't seem so dramatic. And then also just to create a different uh, atmosphere compared to these large lawn spaces that we have to maintain. So we also collaborated with uh, artist Diasta Gates to create two additional memorial spaces uh, that help tell the story of reflection and redemption. Um, this is a future phase, which is still in progress. It was cool to experience, uh, listen and learn from him about some of the narratives he was trying to communicate. Uh, through his work, and these spaces have been carved out and when completed will also be embedded in the landscape. Um, again, the framed view of Tom Lee statue as you enter. Uh, and then again, emphasizing key views out to the river um, with the bridge in the distance, uh, while also considering, you know, passive surveillance uh, over some of the path network that passes through uh, denser vegetation. And lastly, the habitat terraces. Again, framing the views through uh, some of the mature trees that exist down there. Um, it's more of a naturalized um, area with a lot of um, natural uh, flora there. Uh, and in plan, a series of immersive spaces on this part of the site um, that allow for outdoor learning, uh, interaction, you know, on the ground interaction where there's like step downs, um, log scrambles to really get uh, people moving through uh, this kind of forest area, forested area. Um, this area, because the dike wall did fail, down this area, like a lot of the natural vegetation has kind of like crept into the park here. Um, so we're trying to maintain that aesthetic and, you know, just interplant a lot of native species and try to bolster that um, more naturalized feeling moving through there. So a view of the pollinator lab, which is kind of built into this uh, decking structure. Um, again, views out to this canopy walk in the distance and then also to the river and bridge, bridge beyond. Uh, yeah, so thank you guys. Um, that is Tom Lee Park in a quick overview. Um, if you have any questions or you know want to learn more about what it was like from working, remote working for the last 18 months, feel free to email me at tomaetscapestudio.com. And you can also reach me on Instagram I know a few of the younger students have reached out before asking for portfolio tips and stuff like that. So feel free to reach out. I don't buy it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Kate and Tama. Um, well, I guess everyone's kind of dream project, isn't it? A kind of a, a coastal um, parkland with, um, with um, some rich context and, and history. So um, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, um, I'm going to try and run some Q&A. So if people have got questions, please... Um, um, drop them into the um, Q&A box down the bottom. Kate, um, 
maybe you could just talk a little bit about um, in, in your office and, and how that works and, and, and some of the different, I guess, kind of skills and areas of, of expertise that, that you have that enable you to kind of work so broadly and, and kind of differently. Well, interestingly, I, I've been reflecting on this a little bit, um, and uh, I, I have well, per, uh, from a personal standpoint, and then from the the, the 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 broad range of people that that contribute to the office. So I I have a background in um, political and social thought. So that was my uh, undergraduate. So I was really thinking I was going to be a writer or a sculptor or environmental, you know, activist or something. And then I kind of veered into landscape architecture, realizing I'm sure as many people did like, wait, you can get paid for that. And that's a profession. It wasn't something that was, you know, very obvious to me growing up. So I do feel like having the kind of an analytical or conceptual approach to, to the landscape combined with just a lot of work experience is, is, is something that's quite, quite powerful. Um, and then uh, during my, my, my career personally, then I kind of shifted to teaching urban design. So I think that sort of forced a larger scale of, of uh, uh, context, I suppose, and, and, and putting, you know, it's looking at landscape architecture in relationship to a lot of other things, maybe local economy or uh, land development, etc. So those those I think have been useful in kind of keeping a tension with landscape architecture. And folks in the office, um, you know, for example, we have a planning principal who uh, spent many years uh, in an engineering firm. Like I don't want to say on the dark side to any engineers <laughs> who are on the call, but it sort of felt like on the dark side. And then we we pulled her over into landscape, and so you know she has an incredible knowledge of permitting and and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, processes. Uh, we have, you know, people who um, have horticultural expertise. So I, I kind of mentioned that I try to run scape as like a, as a team, like a soccer team or, or a lacrosse team, if you will. And the, the point is not to have a thousand mini me's, but to have people who are very different and try to create the conditions in which they can work together flexibly and comfortably. So, so many different skills kind of come in come into play. Yeah, good. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming through. Um, um, one here about um, about the park project. Um, and, and I know we, we always have challenges in, in this part of the world sort of with um, reclamation and, and kind of declamation, um, which is always sort of controversial, but it looks like um, you know made some quite significant um, changes to the to the kind of coastline um, on that project, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about a bit more about that. Tom well, there, yeah, yeah, I'll I'll do two minutes and I'll kick it to you, yeah. Tama, for timely. But in, interestingly, the um, in in the in the U.S. context, um, you know, I, I would say you know the waterfront is the most contested ground. It is bar none, you know. So the San Francisco Park that I showed that's under construction was actually cutting into the landmass, which of course had been filled as I'm sure much of the urban land has been filled. So in that, um, in the case of China Basin, we were kind of scooping out and stepping back from the, you know, the bulkheaded shoreline. Tom Lee was a slightly different, you know, I like how, you know, Thomas said the dike wall failed. I'm always like the dike wall succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in, 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 in a funny way in, in Memphis, uh, we were quite constrained, weren't we, weren't we, Tama? Because we couldn't really uh, touch that dike wall because of the, um, uh, you know, the sort of regulations that were in play with the Army Corps. So we ended up kind of piling up and trying to capture a lot of stormwater behind it, but we weren't able to truly cut in and modify the shoreline. Is that right? Yeah, we, we that is right. We actually didn't touch the dike wall at all. Um, we would have liked to have made some tidal shelves or we tried really of, hard like, down yeah. <laughs> we rejected uh, but yeah we actually didn't touch the dike wall at all so all of our programming and park enhancements were all kind of set back uh we actually had a 150 foot offset uh from that dike wall uh which had zero cut or fill so um yeah I guess that if that answers your question, uh, we weren't really able to get that over the line. If, yeah. The um, 
maybe a, another question would be around perhaps you know the the, the way in which and, and Tama you might have some observations on on what's the same or, or different I guess in terms of um, you know working with the, your First Nation communities and that sort of consultation and, and collaboration that that happens on on, on your projects um, in terms of what what's the same or similar um, in terms of how we operate in Aotearoa versus um, versus the state. Yeah, I think it's uh, very different. Uh, I think we have a kind of a bit of a privilege in New Zealand, seen as we, you know, not only were kind of like the last place in the world to kind of be colonized uh, fairly recently and establish a treaty, um, even though, you know, the treaty wasn't necessarily um, followed until more recent times. Um, I, th I think we've just got a more, um, well, we also have a smaller population, right? And we're also not state run. Uh, so each state here operates differently. So it is hard to uh, start those conversations and get the right people involved, right, with projects. Um, I think it's a slow game and I think uh, we are moving in the right direction. And that's evident with, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and then just, you know, people being more aware of um, some of the privileges that we have within not only our industry but in other industries and how we need to enact change to kind of push those agendas um yeah i'm sorry it's kind of like a roundabout answer but it, it is difficult here and you know it is a slow game but we are trying to make advancements in that area um and trying to really connect with people and get people to trust designers right because they do have a long-standing history of just coming in and changing a place without uh, consultation. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's first about establishing uh, those connections with local uh, First Nation tribes and uh, communities, local communities, because uh, it is a diverse uh, makeup here in the US, even more so than New Zealand, <laughs> um, especially in New York, you know, you jump on the train, you hear probably 20 different languages um, at a time. So there's lots of people uh, to cater to and there's uh, you know, everyone has their own personal um, history in this in this landscape. Mm, nice. Um, got a couple of other questions coming in here. Um, one about um, I, one is about here about sort of style versus process, and perhaps whether or not there's a um, is there escape style or is it is it? Um... <laughs> That's a great question because at, at a certain point, actually, I was with Jeannie Gang, who was the, the architect um, from Studio Gang, who's an old, old friend. And I can't remember, it might have been 20 years ago when she, we were talking and I was like, okay, well, what's a Jeannie Gang building? And she said, well, what's a Kate Orff landscape? And we were both like, I hope we never know because it does feel like, I do feel like one of the, one of the challenges of staying fresh and it and and kind of ahead of the game is to kind of be open to sites and be open to a lot of inputs so um i mean i will say there are principles which are we we tend to you know we tend to lead with ecosystems and we tend to lead with kind of analysis and i tend to think of like every project being so incredibly precious like okay we have you know, 75 linear feet of waterfront. So what can we do? Because this is our one generation. This is only going to happen once in 50 years. So we really have to fight for this and try to get it, get it right and do the right thing. Uh, but of course, um, so, so I would just say I've been trying to not be driven by style. And if you look at the book Toward Nerve Ecology, it's, it's, it's kind of organized by, uh, by theme and by concept. And so that's, that's really what 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 I think has been a driver and, and a kind of a, a creative, proactive approach to these different projects. And it's really, you know, kind of pushing levers and levering them open to try to figure out what what kind of um, you know positive outcome could come from this, which is you know leaving that legacy. So it's a great question. Um, um, we've got another one here. I guess it's something that's probably facing everyone at the moment, and about you know how you're managing, I guess projects um, whilst we're all in lockdown, and and perhaps how things are going with um, projects that are also under construction, and what 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 you what you might have learned out of out of that challenge. You want to take that one, Tama? Ah, uh, sure. 
uh, I guess with Tomney Park in particular, um, we're kind of fortunate to have part of the team uh, based out of New Orleans, so, which is closer to Memphis. Uh, so they have been facilitating a lot of the site visits uh, and speaking, uh, you know, those stones that were being laid and stuff like that. Um, I mean, in an ideal world, I would have loved to have gone down to Memphis, but it's not as easy, uh, you know, to travel nowadays and just, you know, the whole oh, yeah. logistics of things. So it just makes sense for now to have the more uh, New Orleans based um, part of the team kind of take take the charge on that. Yeah. I mean, more moreover, I suppose it's it's hard to think back to the early days of the pandemic, but okay. Um, you know, I, I feel like I don't want to say it's normalized now because it's certainly not. I mean, this I think everyone globally is kind of traumatized and and still working working through that. But if I think back to you know March and and you know of uh, when everything was unfolding, there was like a sense that there was going to be a global economic meltdown, right? Like with New York that was spiking and. So some of our projects, even more than the threat of, you know, working remotely in COVID, you know, that we had developers and, and other people kind of put the brakes on and say, okay, we don't know what's going to happen this year or next year. And so it kind of, that we're still kind of digging out of that conservative position a little bit. And moreover, the cost of materials basically quadrupled. So steel, you can just kind of go down the the list for everything that one needs for construction and that all also quadrupled and then you know the lead times um, also extended so it, it actually has been quite difficult in terms of schedules and, and so on to to kind of keep keep moving forward in construction yeah yeah um we might probably have time for one more um there's one here Kate, about um, so what, what led to your interest and involvement um, in relation to the um, Mississippi Delta? But I mean, maybe beyond that as well, um, you know, you, you do a lot of coastal work. Is that, was that sort of intentional or uh, accidental? Um, good. I, I'm from the Annapolis, Maryland area. I don't know. Annapolis is an old uh, kind of a port city in the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, so I, I sort of feel like grew up around this sort of, you know, the baylands of, of Maryland and essentially kind of rediscovered that history after I moved to New York City and realized, okay, this is also a port town, a very different scale, but our water, our water bodies and our waterfront seemed incredibly distant. Whereas in, in Annapolis, you were, you know, people would boat around to go out to dinner or something like that. So it was just, um, you know, being in the New York context, kind of realizing that, that that was a big disconnect. So that was part of it. And and then, you know, started with, with Jamaica Bay and thinking about the New York Harbor and, and just really feeling like that was a massive blind spot, you know, at that time, you know, in 2005, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And, um, and then sort of started to try to just permeate that and kind of pull that up as being the grounds of landscape arc landscape architecture uh, rather than something that is just like you draw the line at the edge and somebody else does that uh, so I guess it was a bit of a combination of a personal deep personal interest and in kind of personal culture uh, and the times um, at a certain moment in 2009 uh, we were you know and, and from 2005 on I was writing about climate and thinking about um, our, our city and uh, was asked to kind of, you know, I think that the, the times demanded uh, an incredibly robust interaction with water bodies. We were looking at sea level rise, we had storm surge, we had rain events that really shook New York up uh, and, and, and sort of demanded this focus. And the Mississippi, there was just a um, a New Yorker article that came out and, and when I, I kind of talked a lot about our Mississippi work in that in that article. And to me, the Mississippi is extraordinary because it is, it is like the, you know, it's like the biggest bite of the apple in terms of landscape in the United States. And the Petrochemical America book, I always felt was incredibly, you know, it was like a book that took, uh, was an analytical and conceptual and tried to draw the lines. But I felt like it needed a 
project that was a positive reaction to that book. So was always um, kind of thinking about well, what is the answer to Petrochemical America? And so one of the things, one of my quote unquote answers, at least of how I'm trying to position it is, is really taking back the Mississippi River uh, and writ large and actually just did uh, a big design studio uh, with 12 sites up and down the Mississippi with the National Wildlife Foundation and the, um, and the Walton Family Foundation and uh, a whole group of nonprofit partners to take the biggest, you know, what's called America's River and, uh, and uh, try to reclaim it. And so that's, we have coastal work in, in New Orleans, but then I'm also, you know, kind of looking at the, the river, river as a whole. So Memphis was an incredible treat also to be able to have that project in the office. Fantastic. Um, well, look, I think we're, we're kind of out of time. So look, um, Kia ora and thank you, Kate and Tama. Um, it's been a real privilege to hear from you and, um, um, all the best with um, carrying on and all the good work. And um, um, thanks also to, um, to Streetscape, um, our sponsors, for enabling us to, um, to put this on. I hope everyone's um, enjoyed it. And um, yeah, join us again. Um, I think 11th of November, we've got uh, Sin Nielsen from, um, also from New York. Um, um, here we go. Um, there's the poster. Um, so look out for that one if you haven't already signed up. Um, and um, thanks for joining us.